Okay. To the recording. <laughs> so let's start with segment notation. This is a 1050 thing, but it, it's not a huge topic in 1050. You only saw it once at the very, very end of, of pre-calculus. Yeah. So when we first started learning Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yep. That's our last objective there. That's a great connection. Do you remember how crappy it was though to find the derivative using the limit process? Do you remember how fun that was? No, that was the worst thing ever. It was the f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x as delta x approaches zero. You remember that? Yeah. So anyway, it's it's kind of similar. That's what this objective here is: find the area of a plane using plane region using limits. Anywho, does this look familiar to anybody? This is sigma. Yep. Sweet. Sigma is also called summation notation. It just means you're adding terms. Okay. There's a sign for it. Yeah. So write this down. So if you have this symbol, the summation, if i is equal to 1 to n of a, what does this number top down here tell you? Do you remember? Uh, where it starts. How it works. The i equals 1 says where it starts. The n is how many you're adding up, how many terms you're adding up. So we're going from 1 to n. And this would be your expression. This tells you what your values are going to be. This is a function. It could be something like x squared or 4n minus 2. This, this is just an expression right here. And you plug your values down here into your expression to get the terms that you're adding together. Does that, you, does that ring a bell yes. from last year? So it would be a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus all the way to your ending value, a sub n. I don't want to take a ton of time with this review. I want to get into the area, but just just as a sake of practice, uh, evaluate the sum. I'll do three of them. Try that one. <laughs> oh no, there are some formulas. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Isn't there are it, some formulas. Isn't it the like uh, one half times n something? I remember it's like the n number plus the beginning number times one half the number. Or you should try that or something. Yeah. So yeah, you guys are on the right track. But let's just do this the long way. All right. Okay. Two words. I mean, I say the long way. There's only four terms we're adding together. It shouldn't be that hard. Supposed to be evaluating the sum. Is this ringing a bell? No. Are we stuck? What is. Uh, let, let's break this down again. We're starting with an i value of 1 and we end with an i value of 4. We have to plug these i values into something. What do we plug them into? We plug them into this expression. So the first time you plug in an i value, what's the number we're going to use? i equals 1. How do we know we're going to start with 1? What if I put a 0 right here? What would we have started with? 0. 0. So if I say i equals 1, then the first term is going to be 2 times 1, which is 2. 2 minus 3? Negative. Negative 1. So there's the first term of our sequence. Or series, I guess. Now we add that. The reason that we know that we're adding these together is that's what this symbol means. This is summation notation. Summation means you have a bunch of numbers, you add them all up. Okay. Now, this is when i equals one. What are we adding if i equals negative? If i equals two, well, you plug in a two for i. Two times two is four. Four minus three. One. So that's when i equals two. <laughs> now, when i equals three, two times three is six. Six minus three. 
So that's when i equals 3. Now if i equals 4, 2 times 4 is 8. 8 minus 3 is 5. That's when i equals 4. How much longer do we have to go? No longer. That's it. I started at 1. It ended at 4. So now we add this up. So the answer is 8. Okay. So now that you've seen, try this one. The answer is just eight, because that's the sum of that series right there. So let's try this one. The sum from J equals three to seven. J squared plus 2. Try that one. I don't know if your teacher told you the story last year in Pre-Calculus about Gauss. Remember that story? He was a little schoolboy. He was supposed to add the numbers from 1 to 100. Yeah. And uh, the teacher thought it would take him a little while. It's a lot of numbers, but Gauss did uh, the problem in just a couple of seconds by coming up with this little formula. In his, or the formulas I'm going to show you here in a second. He was a just a boy, like 11 years old. What he did was he thought he came up with the equation, but he really just plugged into this guy. He plugged into the TI-80. Alright, so when J equals 3, 3 squared is 9, 9 plus 2 is 11, so we add that. This is when J equals 3. Uh, when J equals 4, 4 squared is 16, plus 2 is 18. When J equals 5, well, these numbers get big. 5 squared plus 2 plus 7. That's when J equals 5. 6 squared plus 2 is 38. And 7 squared plus 2 51. That's when J equals 7. That's the end of the series. So now we add that up. And what is it? 145. Okay. It's going to be oh, I was doing plus three, so. It's going to be more beneficial to you if you can understand You guys, you guys with me over here? It's going to be a little better for what's coming up if you can understand this a little more symbolically. So I'm going to do k equals 1 to n of 1 over n k squared Plus one. We're starting with a k value of one. But if you notice in our expression, we have one over n and then k squared plus one. So if I'm going to start with a k value of one, you can only plug that into k. You can only plug it into k. So the first term of our sequence, if k equals 1, what's the first term going to be? It's 1 over n times k squared plus 1, where k is 1, so that's 1 plus 1. It's 2, right? That's the first term of our sequence. You guys are out with that? Which would be 2 over n, yeah. The second term of our sequence is when k equals 2. 2 squared is 4. Plus 1 is, so it's 1 over n times 5. The next term would be 1 over n, and then if k equals 3, 3 squared plus 1. So do we at least agree, looking at this, that each of the terms is going to have 1 over n? Okay. Now where does this stop? 
until we get to Earth. So, if we're going to evaluate the nth term when k equals n, where do you plug that into? Where do you plug k equals n? Where do you plug that into into the expression? Come on, guys. You plug it in for k. So the nth term is going to be 1 over n, and then inside the parentheses, instead of k squared plus 1, it's going to be n squared, n squared plus 1. Okay. So we didn't have any specific values to plug in. We were just doing this symbolically. We wouldn't be able to go much further with that one. Okay. So here's some of the formulas you guys learned last year. You might as well just write them down again. Was that the answer? Yeah, you would just leave this. Summation formulas, this is some of what you learned last year, hopefully. Hopefully, which teacher didn't teach it last year? Hopefully, you learned some of these. So if you're taking the sum from i equals 1 to n, of a constant. Rather than me just telling you what this is going to equal, let's think about this. C is a constant, yes? That yeah. means there's nothing to plug it into. So each time we have a term of the sequence, what's that term always going to be? Constant. It's going to be which constant, though? C. It's going to be C. So if we have C plus C plus C plus C plus C plus C, n number of times. C, C, C times n. C, C times C times C times C is C to the n. But C plus C plus C is n C. That's what Dave's going to have when he gets back to his class. <laughs> <laughs> Repeated addition, like C plus C plus C, that just means it's C n number of times, so it's C times. You guys understand that? Yeah. So if you're taking the summation of a constant, then it's that constant multiplied by the number of times you're adding it together. Anyway, there's, there's one property. This is Gauss's property here that he came up with as a young boy. Did you show his work? I don't know. <laughs> so we're taking uh, the summation of a linear expression where the exponent is just 1. That was equal to that. This is the one you spent most of your time with in pre-calculus last year. N times n plus 1 over 2. You remember how Gauss took the first number and the last number, added it together, then divided it in half? Yeah. That's what this is. This is the first and the last divided by two. What's that? I equals whatever it equals down here. So this, it turns into a constant once you plug the value into it, but it turns into a different constant every time. Wait, so this is a variable. I is a variable. The kid did what? See, you never heard this story? Well, I've heard the story. I just can't remember. Like, so we had to add 1 plus 2 plus 3 yeah. plus all the way to 100. Right? So we just took the first and the last number, added it, and then the second and the second. So each time it, the sum is 101, right? Yeah. And how many of those are there in this? 50. 50. So it's, it turned out to be 101 times 50. One plus anyway, uh, the third one, the third summation formula, if you're taking the sum of a quadratic, something with a square, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all over 6. Oh, sorry, I squared. Missed that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. It's I squared, yeah. If you solve this one too, <laughs> he uh, helped in the development of this kind of theory. 
Uh, I equals one to n of a cubic. I to the third. He's like, I'm the one who comes to school because I just want to learn to do it. These three especially, you're going to use these. I don't, see, I don't think you use this one too much. Do you guys remember uh, very, very, very early, after we had talked about finding limits, we got into derivatives. What is the derivative? It's slope, instantaneous slope. It's an instantaneous rate of change, and it's the slope of a tangent line. The derivative is a function that tells you the slope of a tangent line, right? Right. Now, along a curve, the tangent line slope is always changing. That's why the derivative has an equation, or a, it's an equation, so you can plug in distinct <laughs> x values to find a certain slope. You remember that discussion? Yeah. So you, need to, you just need to remember the derivative tells you the slope of a tangent line. Well, we introduced, uh, or I introduced integrals to you last time, okay? Um, let me get up this here. The integral, uh, the definite integral is where this is headed. The definite integral is the area underneath what's called a curve. A curve is just a graph. So this graph right here, this is a curve, right? So the area underneath the curve and above the x-axis between two particular x values, that's equal to what's called the definite integral. So this, this idea of integration, definite integration, we're going to be finding the area underneath the graph and above the x-axis uh, just for different functions. So when you're thinking about derivatives, what is a derivative? Slope of tangent line. Tangent line. What's an integral? Area. Area under a curve. Under a curve. Pretty much. Okay. Now, when we started doing derivatives, we had to approximate derivatives using the slope of a secant line. Do you remember that? And as the secant line got closer and closer to the tangent line, didn't that better approximate the tangent line? Remember that? Yeah. If we change delta x to be smaller and smaller and smaller, the secant became the tangent? Yeah. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. We're not ready to really evaluate the full area under a curve. So we're going to approximate in this lesson, we're going to approximate the area of the curve using rectangles. Okay. Here's what I mean. Let me get rid of this. So, uh, Josh, want to hit the lights? I can't see this too well. Maybe you can't either. Do you see how where my mouse is? is a little bit darker. Can you see that on my screen, or is it not? You can't really see that. I don't know if I can change this. Darker properties. Color. Maybe this will make it. Nope. Well, this area is supposed to be darker. It's a shade of blue than this area. Can you see that difference on the screen? Come on! Let me try it again. Darker. Darker? Black. Black. Oh, opacity. Ooh, that might work. Or is it opacity? Is it opacity? <laughs> Ooh, that's better. Can you tell the difference now? Yeah. So, anyway, shh, 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 shh. Okay. This is the area underneath the curve between 0 and 2. Would you guys agree? Yes. Okay. Finding out this exact area, is, is this a regular polygon? Would you guys consider this a regular polygon? No. So it's kind of hard to figure out the exact area of this without knowing something about integration. We know a little bit, but not enough right now to find out this exact area. You guys agree? I agree. So what we do is we approximate the area using rectangles. So if I had these rectangles right here, okay, is this the exact area? Are the area of all of these rectangles equal to the exact area? No. But would you say it's kind of close? Yeah. Yeah, most of it. What if I increase the number of rectangles? Oh, you're get closer. 
Is that closer to the area? Yeah. What if the number of rectangles approached infinity? Yeah. Doesn't that become the area? Yeah. So that, that's actually the last objective. Uh, the last objective said um, approximate the area using limits to infinity. Well, as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, we actually find the area. But for right now, we're going to approximate using rectangles. Now, answer me this question. Is the area of the rectangles less than or greater than the area of the actual region? Less than. Okay. What about if we do it this way? What if we do rectangles in this way? It's greater. But isn't it still pretty close? Yeah. Okay. And as n approaches infinity, isn't the area of those large rectangles going to better approximate the area of the region? Yeah. Okay. Put um, one. So let me show you what the actual area is. Maybe. Can you see that? Show object, show label. There it is. The actual area underneath this curve is 7.33. Okay? The area of these triangles right now is 7.81. Wouldn't it make sense that the upper area is larger than the actual area? Yeah. But if this increases to 12 rectangles now. It's 7.66 and the area is still 7.3. So if we increase the number of rectangles, we're going to better approximate the area. That, that's really all this is trying to show. We okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So I want you guys to try your best to draw this on your notes. The function is y equals negative x squared plus 5. That means it's an upside down parabola whose vertex is at 5. So it kind of looks like this. approximate the area using five rectangles. Actually, I'm going to be more specific. Five, sorry, I'm going to use a word here that you might know. Inscribed. Hopefully you know that word. Maybe I should have explained it with that picture. What do you, what do you think inscribed rectangles means? The ones inside, right. The ones outside are called circumscribed. So you're either going to find the area using inscribed rectangles or circumscribed rectangles. Okay. So. This is a couple of tough questions I'm going to ask you guys. <laughs> Approximate the area using five inscribed rectangles between zero and two. Okay. Now. We're splitting up this interval, 0 to 2, into five rectangles. So we need, to know, we need to know the width of each rectangle. So let me ask that again. We have a distance from 0 to 2, but we need to split that up into five rectangles. So you need to think here for a second. If there's five rectangles between 0 and 2, what's the width of each of them? Two-fifths. Okay. So the first rectangle. It's going to be a two-fifths. Where's the next one going to be? Four-fifths. That's just right before one. So we have four-fifths, two-fifths. Then the next one is six-fifths. The next one is eight-fifths. Eight fifths. 
And finally, we have one at 10 fifths. Now, as neatly as you can, let's just draw this. probably can't read this writing, but this is two-fifths, four-fifths, six-fifths, eight-fifths, and ten-fifths. Okay. How do you find the area of one rectangle? Length times height. Length times, in this case, the length of the base times the length of the height. Okay. Well, we already know the length of each of the bases here. They're all going to be two-fifths. Two How are we going to find out the height? This, this one's not you quite up into the equation. Doesn't each of these right-sided endpoints, aren't they all on the function? So how would you find the value of the function if you know a specific x value? If you know an x value, how do you find a function value? And what is the function? x squared plus 5. x squared plus 5. So if we're talking about the area of each rectangle... <coughs> It's going to be two fifths. That's the base, right? Two fifths is the base. Mm -hmm. And then isn't it going to be F of two fifths times I, where I is equal to one, two, three. Do you understand what I'm doing here? Hold on, let me let me back up then. Let, let me change this into f of x. That might make now that might make more sense. Instead of y equals, let's do f of x. What is this quantity right here? Two fifths. What does that represent? The base. And isn't that going to be the same base for all of the rectangles? Mm -hmm. so that's why it's just two fifths. It doesn't have to have any variables. What does this quantity here represent? The area, no, the height. The height. But you guys, isn't the height always changing of each rectangle? Mm -hmm. So the first x value I plug in is two fifths. I plug in two fifths into the function, right? Mm -hmm. That's when i equals one. What's two fifths times one? Two fifths. What's the next x value I'm going to plug in to find the height of this smaller rectangle here? Two fifths times two. Isn't that going to be four fifths? Well, that's when i equals two, so that's four fifths. Do you see where these i's are coming from? Okay. How do I get a six fifths? Well, that's just two fifths when i equals three. How many i's do I need here? Five. How come? There's, there's five of these rectangles. Okay. Yeah. It's it's beyond. It doesn't hit right at two. Two is not the exact or the x No, because I'm only wanting to go from zero to two. Yeah, we're only approximated between zero and two. Okay. So, I just want to make sure now we're clear on where this I came from. Where did the I come from? How many rectangles we had? Yeah. If there had been six rectangles, then I would be six. six. Okay. Now, why is it f of two fifths I? Well, to find the height, isn't the height a function value? So you plug in this x value into the function. So the function of the parabola, which is negative x squared plus, what was it, negative x squared plus 5. Okay. Now, answer me this question. 
to, to find out the total area of all five triangles, don't we find out the area of each one and add them up? Didn't we just practice something where we found the individual terms and then we added that all up? Yes. Okay, wasn't that a summation? Yeah. So to approximate the area, we could do the summation from I equals 1 to 5 of 2 fifths times F of 2i over 5. Well, you don't plug 2i over 5 into the equation. You have to replace i with its value first. And then you plug that into the function. Yeah, into the function. This will give you the base. This will give you the height. And together, okay. they give you the area. And then we have to do that five times for each particular rectangle. And once we do that, that'll approximate. Yeah. You still with me? Perimeter? Oh, the career of that one? No. Yeah. There's no use for that in this world. Okay, let's try the picture one more time. Whoa, that's ugly. Holy cow. That's even worse. <laughs> Why is it so difficult? Is that better? Okay. Same thing. We're now going to approximate the area using circumscribed using five particular circumscribed oh, now I have to draw that perfect graphic again. rectangles <laughs> between between zero and two. Let's try it again. So we're going between 0 and 2, and if there's 5 rectangles, that means each one's going to have a width of 2 fifths again. So we're going to have 2 fifths, 4 fifths, 6 fifths, and 8 fifths. But now they are circumscribed. circumscribed. That means they're outside just a tiny bit. I should have made this a little bit more. Zoom in. Yeah, they'll always give you a bound, a lower bound and an upper bound. These are referred to as upper sums and lower sums. Upper sums and lower sums. Which one do you think we're going to be finding here? An upper or a lower sum? Upper, upper sum. Which one did we find here? A lower sum. They're also sometimes referred to as right side and left side sums. And in that case, we're talking about which side of the rectangle is actually on the function. If you take a look at the first one we did, the tops, was the right side or the left side of the tops of these rectangles on the function? the right side. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes they use terminology right side and left side. On this side here, which top, the, I'm the, talking about the tops of the rectangles, which side is actually on the function? The left side this time is on the function. Okay. So, area of each rectangle
What's the width still going to be? Two-fifths. Okay, so two-fifths. And I want you to identify this in your notes. This is the width. That's never going to change. That's why it doesn't have to have a variable, because it's constant. Now we have to be... I, I know you guys have been here, and this has been kind of heavy. You guys don't really need to think here. It's going to go from zero. What's the height as a function here? So we still have to plug it into the function. Okay. But when we were doing the uh, when we were doing these right-sided ones here, we actually used two fifths and then four fifths because our very first x value wasn't our very first x value two fifths. And then our next x value was four fifths, six fifths, eight fifths, and ten fifths. We used each of those numbers as the height. But aren't the function values different now? We're not actually going to start at two fifths. What are we going to start at? Zero. And we're not going to end at ten fifths. What are we actually going to end with? Eight fifths. So. If you recall, for the lower bounds, it was 2 fifths times i. But that means if i is 1, 2, 3, and 4, and, and we're still going to keep i as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we're not going to change the values of i. We have to actually change. We have to be a little bit more clever about how we define this. So if I want, hold on just one so you have it. If I want this to give me a 0, if i equals 1, I'm not going to have i right here. What am I going to have? Zero. I minus one. I want to make sure we're clear on this. We're always going to use the i value starting at one, two, three, four. In this case, we end at five because there's five rectangles. But I couldn't just leave it as two fifths i because if i equals one, that would mean our first function value is f of two fifths, and we want it to be f of zero. So, is this going to give us a first value of zero to plug in if it's i minus one yeah. times two fifths? Okay. Let's just check what it is we're going to be plugging in. We're going to be plugging in a zero. What would the next thing be that we're going to plug in? Two fifths. Two fifths, and then we're going to plug in a four fifths, and then a six fifths, and shouldn't we end with? Eight fifths. Would this formula end with eight fifths if i equals five? Yes. Five minus one is four. Four, four times two is eight. eight. So that would end with eight fifths. Okay. Right. Go ahead. Why wouldn't you just change the i values to zero from zero to four instead? Uh, in the next example, that'll be answered. Okay. Hold up. So we can finish this one. So the area of each rectangle is the width times the height. But since we're doing this five times, it's going to be a summation. So it's the summation when i equals 1 to 5 of 2 fifths times f. I'm going to simplify and clean this up on the inside a little bit. 2i minus 2. All over five. Okay, and this is really going to stink. But one question, at least one question in your test, and and a couple in your homework, you're going to have to do this by hand. So let's let's do the upper one here. Okay, and it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Not exactly. No, that's a good thought, though. Let's let's do this. For i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, i equals four, and i equals five. Okay. This is, uh, there's no way around it. This is just tedious work that you're going to have to know how to do for your assignment after your test. Okay. 
You guys with me? Yes. So for i equals 1, let's use this summation. You ready for 2 times 1? 2. 2 minus 2? Two. 0 divided by 5? 0. So that doesn't mean this turns into 0. That means we're plugging in a 0 into where? Into the function. So now plug a 0 into your function. Remember, this is the function. Negative x squared plus something. Was it plus 5? So if we're plugging a 0 in, we get 0 plus 5, which is? Five. Five times two fifths two. is two. So the very first value we're going to add there is two. Okay, yeah, there you just got to buckle down and, and do this by hand here. So now we have four minus two, which is two. Two divided by five. Two fifths. If we plug two fifths into the equation and square it, two fifths squared. So it's negative 4 twenty fifths plus 5. Okay. Now you don't have to do all of this by hand. Use a calculator for this if you want to. You have to multiply by 25 over 25. Well, we have to add these two together, but in order to do that, you have to multiply by 25 over 25 to get a common denominator. Yeah, 125 minus 4 is 121 over 25. Now we have to add that when i equals 3. 6 minus 2. So we're plugging in 4 fifths. 4 fifths squared is. Well, that makes sense because that's what we were trying to do the whole time. Yeah. 16. 25th, but then it's negative, and we have to add that to 125, 25th. 125 minus 16. Doing that in my head right now. 109. 109. 109. Thank you, Enrique. 25th. Now we add that to when i equals 4. That gives you 6 fifths. If i equals 4, 4 times 2 is 8, minus 2 is 6, so it's 6 fifths. We're plugging in 6 fifths. That gives you 6, or sorry, 36, 20 fifths. Then you make it negative, and you add that to 125 fifths. 125 minus 36. So we get 61 25th. And then you have to add that all to 50 25th. This is 50 25th. And Brandon will do that in his head real quick. Yeah. So if you have 50 plus 121 plus 109 plus 89 plus 61, then you divide that all by 25. So we're going to Come on, we've got to finish it. Don't leave it. Uh, it's 74.2. What is it? 17.2. Give us a fraction rating. Okay, it's 430 over 25. But that can be simplified, okay. man. <laughs> These were just the function values. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> These were each just function values. Okay. These need to be multiplied by. These all need to be multiplied by two fifths, and then you add that together. Okay. This on a problem like this on a test, it would have to be done by hand, you guys. And you would give us tons and tons of scratch paper, right? This I'm not gonna have a ton of these. One probably. Good thing all this is gonna be a partner test, like our courses did. Okay. We'll pick this up next time.